2013. As we get all choked up <laughs> and stroll down the prairie. Okay. Man. Yeah. I don't talk for 10 minutes. Turn the microphone back on and... Excuse me while I cough up a lung in your ear. Uh, well, we'll go back in time in just a little bit for today in history. Right now, though, it's time for Celebrity Birthdays. Damn it, Jim, what the hell is the matter with you? Other people have birthdays. Why are we treating yours like a funeral? Bones, I don't want to be lectured. Ooh, yeah. Very, very many happy reasons. And take a look at Celebrity Birthdays today. And before we do, if you're celebrating your birthday today, happy birthday. Not many on the list, so it's going to be short. That's what she said. Uh, Julio Iglesias, can you believe this, is 70? Julio Iglesias is 70. One of my fondest memories of him. I don't have very many, though. He was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson back in 83 when uh, To All the Girls I've Loved Before, that song <laughs> came out. Well, I think Julio was expecting Willie Nelson to actually come out with Johnny dressed up as Willie Nelson and sang the song with him. It, it's quite funny. Uh, you ought to watch it. I think it's on YouTube. I'm pretty sure it is. Bruce Springsteen is 64. Boy, that makes you feel old, doesn't it? And Jason Alexander of Seinfeld, the guy that can never get a break, George Costanza. Well, he is 54 today. And those are the celebrity birthdays for this Monday. Well, we have room for one passenger in the time machine like I always do, and I've chosen you. So let's uh, let's all get in the car and uh, find out what happened on this date in history. state in history we go back to 1999 just 14 years ago NASA announced that they had lost the Mars climate orbiter my question is did they look behind the refrigerator be that thing was small so it, it couldn't have gone very far I'm pretty sure it's still somewhere in the solar system <coughs> pardon me <coughs> Oh, I love acid reflux disease. That's what happened on this date in history. For more of Today in History, we go to the Associated Press, and then we'll uh, have the Morning Report and the CBS World News World Roundup. We did get something, a gift, after the election. September 23rd. 1952. Future President Richard Nixon uses what's then the new medium of television to make his case. Nixon, at the time the Republican candidate for vice president, denies charges that he used a secret campaign fund for his personal expenses. Instead, Nixon says the only gift that he had accepted was the family dog, whom his daughters named Checkers. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. 63 B.C. Augustus Caesar, ancient Rome's first emperor and the grand-nephew of Julius Caesar, is born Gaius Octavius in what's now Italy's capital. 1806. Explorers Meriwether Lewis and William Clark end their expedition to America's uncharted west, they returned to St. Louis more than two years after setting out for the Pacific Northwest. 1939. Psychologist Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, dies in London. He was 83. 1930. Just an old sweet song Keeps Georgia on my mind Ray Charles, the singer and pianist who helped pioneer soul music, is born Ray Charles Robinson in Albany, Georgia. And 1949. 
Bruce Springsteen, the rock singer and songwriter known as The Boss, is born in Freehold, New Jersey. Today in History, September 23rd. Camille Bohannon, The Associated Press. This Marketplace podcast. This Marketplace podcast is supported by Mosey Cloud Backup. Protect your critical files with maximum security from Mosey Cloud Backup and securely access them anywhere, including your smartphone or tablet. Visit mozy.com to learn more. An election result with the whole world's economy at stake. This Marketplace podcast is supported by eCornell.com. Join an elite group of professionals and begin targeted online training and marketing that drives results and revenue. Visit eCornell.com slash marketplace for 20% off your online marketing strategy certificate. From APM, good morning. I'm Mark Garrison in for David Brancaccio with the global perspective on business and economics. It's the morning after a big victory for German Chancellor Angela Merkel. But now the hard work of actually forming a government is underway, with major implications going forward for the global economy. Theo Leggett is a BBC business reporter who's been covering the German elections in recent weeks and joins us now. Theo, just to recap, Merkel's center-right bloc got an impressive share of the vote, but the pro-business party she's been in partnership with did poorly. So to form a government, she's likely to have to make some kind of arrangement with the center-left party in second place. Explain how this kind of deal-making could impact Germany's economic policy and, by extension, the global economy. Obviously, Angela Merkel has lost her current coalition partners, which makes life a little bit difficult for her. It does look as though she's going to have to link up with the center-left Social Democratic Party, and that means not a huge change, but some important changes. The centre-left party, they've been calling for things like a national minimum wage. This is something that Germany doesn't have at the moment, unlike many other European countries. They want a little bit more social justice. Now let's talk also elsewhere in the election, another story that people have been watching. A new anti-euro party got a small slice of the vote, but more than some had predicted. Talk about what that says about where the euro sentiment is in Germany right now. Well, this is clearly a result of Germany being seen as the paymaster of Europe. For the past few years, Germany has been orchestrating the rescues of countries like Greece and Ireland. And as a result, as the wealthiest economy in Europe, it's also been paying the most. And that's provoked quite a large ground roots response in Germany where people have been saying, hang on a minute, we pay our taxes. Why are we paying to bail out people in other parts of Europe who've been spending more than they should have for the past few years and are now having to pay the consequences? So it's not a huge section of the vote. Um, The bulk of the population say, "Okay, it wasn't great that we had to do this, but we think that Angela Merkel saved us from something much, much worse, saved Europe from something much, much worse. So we're happy to give her our backing. Okay, Theo Leggett with the BBC. Thanks very much. Thank you. And let's do the numbers. Stocks are mixed in global trading. That's the situation in Europe. Germany stacks down just a touch because the investors are waiting to see how all that negotiation goes. Asian stocks closed mixed. Friday on Wall Street, the S&P dropped 7 tenths percent to end at 17.09. The Dow lost 1.2 percent to finish at 15,451. You can pick up a lot of colorful numbers at the shops and boutiques of West Hollywood, California, but not fur. A citywide ban on selling fur is now in force, maybe the nation's first. Marketplace's Adrian Hill has more. The West Hollywood fur ban isn't likely to stop that many fur sales. Even supporters will tell you that. I do think that this is mostly a uh, symbolic ordinance given how tiny our city is and the small number of businesses affected. That's West Hollywood Mayor Pro Tem John D'Amico, who sponsored the ban. But clearly, its reach and the discussion about it, that's the thats uh, the effect we've been hoping it would have and has been having. Many animal rights activists see it as a victory. Others, like Rutgers law professor Gary Francione, think symbolic bans like this are a distraction. It's not really changing things, and it's not going to change things. So, you know, West Hollywood can do whatever it wants to do. But he says people who want fur will drive down the street and buy it. Francione says these sort of splashy bans can help groups raise money. But he thinks they aren't all that helpful in getting people to think seriously about the welfare of animals, like the ones they're having for dinner. I'm Adrian Hill for Marketplace. This Marketplace podcast is supported by eCornell.com. 
Join an elite group of professionals who have empowered themselves and their organizations with targeted online training and marketing that drives results and revenue. Earn an online Ivy League marketing certificate in as little as three months. Move ahead today. Visit ecornell.com slash marketplace for 20% off your online marketing strategy certificate. Now is the perfect time. That's ecornell.com slash marketplace. Ivy League for the real world. High occupancy vehicle or HOV lanes are starting to give way to HOT lanes in cities across the U.S. That is high occupancy toll or HOT. Atlanta has rolled out HOT lanes. Jim Burris reports on concerns that poor residents are being left behind. It's the height of afternoon rush hour here in Atlanta. And as I drive up Interstate 85, about six lanes of traffic immediately to my right completely stopped, bumper to bumper. But I'm cruising along at 55 miles an hour. And I can do that because I'm willing to pay. I personally don't want to pay. At a car wash beside the highway, Janelle Mobley says she'd rather sit in traffic than buy her way out. I mean, it took enough of our taxes to pay for these interstates, so I think that's enough. Compared to a year ago, more Atlantans are using the hot lanes. But not a lot was known about those drivers until a study by the Southern Environmental Law Center. It analyzed zip codes of paying drivers and found a correlation, says senior attorney Brian Gist. What the data shows is that there is some relationship between income and use. The richer the zip code, the more likely a driver is zooming along in the hot lane. Trips have cost up to eight bucks. The state waives tolls for some vehicles, like three-person carpools. Gist says only a small fraction of drivers even opt for the hot lane. What we need to do is look for a solution for 100 percent of the people rather than 5 or 10 percent of the people. Georgia State Road and Tollway Authority's Burt Brantley says the study failed to take into account one in seven hot lane trips is actually a free ride. So really the analysis is, is very limited. Uh, it is certainly of value to look at, uh, at these kind of things because we're spending tax dollars to build a project. $56 million for this stretch. Brantley says the state will look at income disparity when more data become available later this year. In the meantime, he says the lanes ease congestion, but they don't solve the bigger issue, says Rod Diridon of the Mineta Transportation Institute. Hot lanes are a Band-Aid. He says the long-term fix is more public transportation. Even so, new Lexus lanes are coming to San Francisco, Denver, Charlotte, and here. In Atlanta, I'm Jim Burris for Marketplace. Join us anytime until the end of time at Marketplace.org. I'm Mark Garrison. This is the Marketplace Morning Report. This is APM, American Public Media. Look to a boo, bum, boo, bum, thousand tail pipes does it all. What are you doing? <gasps> Kenya Mall, under siege. You heard this huge explosion near the mall. Washington Memorial for Navy Yard victims. There's nothing normal about innocent men and women being gunned down where they work. TV's Emmy Night. Breaking Bad. Good morning. I'm Steve Kathan with the CBS World News Round. A chaotic and confusing morning at the Westgate Shopping Mall in Nairobi, Kenya. Explosions and gunfire as a bloody siege is in its third day. CBS's Charlie Daggett is outside the mall. We're not sure exactly what took place. This huge explosion followed by a series of further explosions and automatic weapons. We got word that maybe the militants had blown themselves up, but we also heard that maybe the Kenyan military had tried to blast their way in. At this point, we don't know in this fluid and ongoing situation. An unknown number of hostages were being held by the terrorists from the Al-Qaeda-linked group Al-Shabaab. Officials now say 62 are known dead, about 175 injured from the Saturday. Saturday attack that sent shoppers running for their lives. You could hear while we were back there, them methodically kind of going from store to store, shooting, screams. CBS News senior correspondent John Miller joins us. John, what do we know about the group involved here, Al-Shabaab? They start in Somalia around 2005, 2006. By 2008, they were designated by the U.S. State Department as a terrorist organization and recently, just in 2012, they made an announcement with al-Qaeda that they were a part of the al-Qaeda network. Does this suggest, John, that they're perhaps a bigger threat to Americans as we move forward? The concern on the U.S. intelligence side about al-Shabaab has always been, A, it's an al-Qaeda satellite and it's carrying out al-Qaeda's orders. Ex- 